All right, it's Thursday at 4.20 p.m. Eastern. That means it's time for Office Hours, Aroy's weekly session for cultivators to hear from the experts and talk to each other about what they're seeing with their grows. My name is Keisha. I'll be your co-moderator today, and I don't do it alone. How's it going, Mandy? Hey, Keisha. Wow, can you guys believe it? We're already on episode 40, 47. It was two weeks off. I really missed this. So we're live here, and we're also going live over on YouTube. Um, so wherever you're tuning in from, make sure you send us your questions, and I'll make sure I get those over to the team. Um, one quick announcement before we get started today. If you're going to be at the Emerald Cup, be sure you catch up with Keisha. She'll be representing Arroyo out there. Um, and we do have a very special guest grower on today's show. And for that formal introduction, I'm going to throw it back over to Keisha. Awesome. Thank you, Mandy. And yes, I'll be at Emerald Cup as will Seth, my good friend. Seth, tell us who we have in the building, as it were, today. Uh, we got Mikey here. Mikey Giersch. He's the, do you call yourself the head grower, cultivator, manager? Jack of all. Uh, so I'm I'm the grow systems manager. <laughs> we have we a, a head cultivator that's just above me. Um, he's a, a very busy guy, but he did actually jump on the chat today. Uh, but I'm our grow systems manager and the head of the fertigation IPM department, as well as anything anything uh, you know equipment related on the floor that deals with the plants themselves. Absolutely, and that's uh, I guess part of why we got to start talking. It was fun to look at the graphs and start spotting when things started going wrong. <laughs> then I get to hear from Mikey, how, how'd you guys solve it out in the desert? And that's always interesting. It's great, you know, getting together and talking shop for it to try to correlate, you know, what we're dealing with here to what mm -hmm. you guys are experiencing personally and with other clients. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And just, you know, having that insight and being able to look into, uh, I don't know, your facility, it doesn't really I guess I don't see anything that usually doesn't surprise you ever. <laughs> it's more, you know, like, Hey, that's what that looks like on the graph there. Um, but it's, it's fun to solve those problems and see what's out there. I know uh, you've spent a lot of time dialing your place, you know, really getting it dialed in pretty tightly, especially considering, you know, the temperature swings that you experience out in the desert there. Um, you know, like we were batting around a minute ago. We go from, you know, 120 plus in the summers to, you know, the, the low forties and high thirties during the winter seasons. So we have quite a bit of a, a vast change there to, to deal mm -hmm. with, especially keeping up with our ACs during the summer seasons is pretty rough challenge. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess while we're at it though, let's kind of start, what's your, what's your background? How'd you get into growing? Um, I've been growing, I mean, since I was a teenager, uh, it's a, call it the family business. <laughs> 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 um, and then I, I just, uh, applied and applied and applied and pushed until I could get into a uh, corporate grow. I started out with the guys at Mojave cannabis. Mm -hmm. I was with them for a few years and was fortunate enough to work with a lot of great growers and awesome people with that company. Um, and then as vertical came into the, the landscape, I transitioned over here for a little bit more room for advancement. And I've been with vertical a little over four years now working my way uphill. I uh, spent a lot of long time as a bud tender and patient to patient grower doing 30 lighters and, stuff like that prior to getting into commercial cultivation. Yeah. So you've, you've seen it all basically. <laughs> and Whether that's definitely rock wool, aeroponics, flood tables, full of silica <laughs> pellets. <you know? laughs> oh yeah. You know, you, you kind of got to try it all to figure out what works at some point, you know, that's uh no one arrives straight at rock wool and cocoa right off the bat. You know, we had to start with soil, hydroponics, all that fun stuff. Um, how, how do you think the industry is changing, you know, right now, like versus a year ago? Cause we went through, you know, kind of a huge push. Like when you first started growing, it might've either been in the ground or in pretty big pots, I'm assuming, you know, back yeah, in the day, 15 gallon pots, yep. you know, getting these, these five foot tall plants before you flip them, you know, trying to get as much mass as possible. Yep, exactly. And then now, I mean, it's, it's totally different, right? Like we're looking at small plants, small containers, uh, moving up to the slabs over the years, that was like a, a huge thing. I think that's revolutionized the indoor game for a lot of people. Um, even, even compared to the, the Hugo's just the amount of uh, plant you can get off of a slab efficiently and easily is pretty yeah, impressive. A lot, of guys, a lot of the guys I talk to running the slabs now are just, they're, they're flipping plants at, you know, 11 to 13 inches instead of 18 to 24 mm -hmm. and running 50 to 75% more plants generating, yeah. you know, 20 to 24 inch tall plants at the end of life to just, cut the difference in plant volume size versus number of plants in the room, you know? Right. And that's, that's a huge thing I've noticed lately is, you know, people are finally embracing going to a little bit smaller plant size, trying to go to a, you know, a lower pruning technique that gives you uh, 
a little more mass on the plant, but also, I mean, that time in there trying to mess with it is brutal. Yeah. The, the plant maintenance cuts down so much. That's the, the ease on your team is the biggest factor that comes in with that, with minimizing your plant size. Oh yeah. And I mean, you know, at the end of the day, labor is like one of the the biggest cost because it's so variable, right? Like we can kind of <laughs> count on power prices roughly within a month. We can count on water. If our labor is all over the place month to month, that, that makes it pretty tough. You know, one, one emergency can add a lot of labor cost. Yeah, and thankfully we're, we're in a world now where we have all the appropriate equipment where we can start actually accessing and analyzing the data and you know, quantifying what we're doing so we can say, grow wedding cake that isn't seven feet tall. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yep. And, you know, having, having a recipe to stick to, you know, especially in terms of irrigation that you can execute day after day after day. I know one huge thing that I've noticed that's uh, been pretty cool compared to talking to, you know, well, and just back in the day, knowing a lot of people trap growing and stuff especially kind of out in sticks, power outages, <laughs> you know, you can grow in facilities now where you can pull off a whole run without, you know, any power. Maybe you got some internet interruption, but your equipment's reliable. Yeah. The, you know. the, the infrastructure improvements over the last decade have been phenomenal in Southern mm. California. I mean, like 10 years ago, we were looking at three day long power outages out here in the Mojave. Right. Like you were lucky if you were able to keep some of your food, you know, mm-hmm. 110 out at night. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You're like, don't open the freezer. Yeah, <laughs> Put don't, a lock on don't, it. Don't open the doors. It's hotter outside. <laughs> Actually, Michael, yeah. I have a question. Can you describe your facility? What's, what's it like? Uh, so we have we have two separate grow buildings on the property out here in Needles. We have a two story uh, where we run LEDs across the entire building, and then we have a single story building with an additional nine flower rooms and two bedrooms where we're running dual end thousand watts. Got to gotta keep that old industry feel in there. Still got to have that, that high yield production from that far red light. <laughs> oh, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> it just, it feels too good to let go of yet. We, I mean, the LEDs are wonderful and uh, two thirds of our property is transitioned to LED across mm-hmm. the board, but uh, there's something about those high pressure sodium lights. They just can't let go of yet. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. They're a little different. And I mean, I don't know the, the biggest downside I've seen out of those over the years, and it depends on where you are, you know, obviously the heat, but like, uh, you know, where I'm at in the winter, that's, that's pretty welcome. Uh, but you know, um, just, just kind of the, the ease of use and they, they've been around, you know, they're not expensive. And in the world of LEDs too, I find sometimes it's, uh, everything's so competitive. There's always new tech coming out at a certain point. It's like, what's, what's adequate versus what's the pinnacle. Cause there's always going to be a shifting pinnacle, but we've always got an adequate baseline that works. Right. Yeah. So, so far we've had very good luck with the Gavita 1930s. Mm-hmm. They've been wonderful fixtures for us. The, we've had even light production, very little diminishing, you know, in production and for actual, you know, intensity throughout the rooms over about two and a half years now. We're still running pretty strong. We've only lost, I mean, less than 2% fixtures over almost a three-year period. Yeah, that's awesome. I think those perform great too, especially when you've got a room that was built for HPS, you got a little bit taller ceiling. It's a, it's a better direct bolt-in without, uh, I don't know, that's always disappointing to see people switch over from a thousand watt HPS to like a seven, 700 watt LED when they're like, oh, I gotta lower my lights. And it's like, yeah, you're gonna have to fine tune that now. That's just another thing, so. There's definitely merit in using the old tech. Well, at least we're in a world now where people are, are more brushed up on what's happening with the lights. So you don't mm-hmm. have uh, I mean, early on with LEDs, you had a lot of people purchasing like what they were being sold because there wasn't enough market data on the lights themselves yet. Mm-hmm. So you had a lot of companies producing like 315, 340 watt lights that they were guaranteeing commercial yields with. And a lot of companies got shot in the foot by that early on buying those 340 watt lights and thinking they were just going to, drop them down on top of the canopy and they'd be fine. They got, you know, big veg plants instead. <laughs> flowers. Oh yeah. Well, and I mean, yeah, when you look back at it too, you know, they were, they kind of initially put some of those LEDs and even the T5 fixtures in, and like uh, gymnasiums and stuff, you know, <laughs> yeah. arenas, cause they're replacing HID lighting for like sports <laughs> arenas and it looks pretty damn bright in there. <laughs> you know, it's hard. It's still hard to look at a 350 watt light without glasses on. It's not good for you. But, but if you don't have the the science behind it and have the actual data on what yeah. it's putting out, then you, you're not aware that it's, it's still too little. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, the same thing even goes for, uh, you know, some bigger greenhouse grows where you go and you, you look up and you're like, wow, the lights are like 14 feet up. 
Yeah, I get it. <laughs> that's like where all my purlins are. That's where everything lines up. I can strap them up there and it's easy, but you might want to get a light meter and kind of dial it a little bit, you know? And, and that one's a great rule of thumb for if you can just look up, your lights aren't bright enough. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Exactly. But you know, that's, uh, it's taken more and more science over the years to establish that, you know, we kind of always knew like, Hey, you get better production and warmer, brighter climates. Right. But Greenhouses came along not to be the most controlled indoor environment ever. They've always, you know, until cannabis came along, basically, at least in the U S they've been built to be just enough, you know, what's, what's adequate. It's always farmer mentality and that still carries over into cannabis, but we do have a little bit better margin to work with. And, uh, I think a higher interest in ensuring qu crop quality compared to a lot of vegetables, for instance. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, well, and you look at a lot of the vegetable markets and there's such a high waste rate for what they produce. Like, I mean, there's, there's all these ugly food markets opening up for a reason because yep. the huge majority of what's produced goes to the wayside because it's not even aesthetically pleasing. And then we can mm -hmm. move fast out of it. That's just goes straight to the garbage because it's not actually adequate in style and fashion. Like it's, it's construction. It's base form is inadequate in size and flavor and just overall fucking composition. <laughs> Right. Exactly. So when you're dealing with that kind of market and spoilage, you know, like you can only put so much into a tomato because you know, you're going to lose 20 to 30% potentially, depending on where your market is and, you know, your resources to get it off the vine in time. You know, if you've got indeterminate tomatoes and you can't pay harvesters to go out every day, you know, in mid to late summer, like, well, you're going to lose some tomatoes. <laughs> that's how it goes. Yeah. Well, that's been a, another wonderful thing working with guys like, like Josh, that's on the, the call with us today. And, learning more about nutrient balances and getting to talk to the guys that have been in the industry, you know, much longer than I have and being able to learn about their experiences and start quantifying what I'm dealing with based on what they're, you know, providing for us, being able to work with that information moving forward has really been a wonderful fucking thing. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Having good resources and especially people that are, you know, uh, experienced in what they're, what they're, what you're actually growing specifically, like with cannabis, there's so many, over the years, there's been so many nutrient companies out there. And then there's so many, you know, case specific situations. What's your water quality like? You know, there's certain nutrient lines that like probably are going to be tough to run if you have poor quality or tough to inject. And, in, in, you know, there are a lot of different problems that can arise from that. Or, you know, just like anytime you can talk to someone who's gone through it before, you don't have to make the same mistakes. That's what I value about meeting with you. <laughs> A lot of the older guys, you laugh about irrigation system problems or, oh yeah, mainly irrigation system problems and water quality issues. <laughs> You're like, wow, we've got enough background now to uh, actually solve some of these issues. There's resources. We're, we're past the world of water wands and octo bubblers. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, just e even injection systems, you know, like if you look at the breadth of designs over like the last 10 years that every year people are getting better and better and it's uh you know, part of it's because that on a commercial scale, people hadn't been doing it with this small of an injection system indoors, like high volume outdoor, like say some big berry farms or produce farms in Southern California with these huge injection systems. When you've got a six inch pipe and a lot of water flowing through it, that's a little bit different mixing, you know, with these smaller systems, it's taken years of people essentially finding all the weak spots, you know, what, what is the best way to line your dosatrons up? Yeah. <laughs> I've, how I've how seen, much space do you need for appropriate mixing in a half inch line? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I've seen, I've seen a lot of different solutions to that <laughs> screwed to a bunch of different walls. And, uh, I can tell you there's a wide range in success. So it's yeah. definitely, yeah, it's nice to be able to like have some reliable resources like that. I know Josh and Ramsey help a lot of people out, especially on the nutrient side. And, uh, that's great. And it's an awesome resource. <laughs> Michael, you're, I have another question for you. Um, you're the grow systems manager there. And I'm hearing all, just so far, you've talked a little bit about like kind of bridging that gap between like just kind of the, the legacy um, techniques and data. Um, and so I would love to like your, your role as growth systems manager, um, you know, is that part of what you do is kind of bring in some recommendations for things to adopt in your facility? Yes. Um, our, our head cultivator, um, Orion Santana does, uh, any, any calls go through Orion, um, but it's, it's my position to try to research and provide the best routes that I can so that when that call is made, it's one with appropriate research and appropriate backing behind it. 
And I've, as well, it's fortunate he's also an industry, you know, longtime industry grower, um, has had clone companies in the past, currently has Orion, Orion Genetics. If anybody's looking for some fresh OGs out there. <laughs> um, but it's it's great to be able to work with him as well, to have somebody else that has a decade plus of experience in the commercial industry to be able to help make these calls with and throw stuff against and have it bounce back. Um, but bringing in new science, bringing in the information from these guys and putting it up against what we're being told from our ground level growers, because working with your team is the only way to succeed at this level. Like having a wonderful team and working with what your team's feeding you is the only way this can work. Um, so a lot of your, your ground level guys don't have access to the same information we have right now. They don't, and they don't have the time to get online and research and read. Those guys are busy busting their ass while I'm sitting in a chair, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's about bridging that, that gap between the information we're being provided and working it into the old fashioned style of growing, trying to integrate the newer practices into what we've been doing that we, we know is successful. And then channeling that data back uphill through Seth and through Jason and trying to find a way to relate that to what other people are dealing with and create new programs to try to advance what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you guys get to do a lot of cost benefit analysis on things coming in <laughs> and then, uh, you know, it, having tools really allows you to analyze what you were doing before. And at the end of the day, I always like to tell people, you know, this is, it's half science, half art. The art part is, uh, you, the grower knowing, you know, it's not necessarily knowing the pulse or the feel of your plant, although a lot of people like to put it that way, but it's being able to look at it and tell if it's healthy. You know, is, is this plant responding to what I'm doing in a positive way or the way I want it to, you know? And when we're talking indoor cultivation, there's so many individual factors that go into each grow space. Yep. I, we have, we have 31 flower rooms here on property and every one of them is a unique environment. <laughs> yep. So it, it, these, these guys ground level have to have a feel for every individual room and the plants of each, each strain in each yep. room and how they're going to react to that unique environment. Yep. And I mean, a lot of it just comes down to problem solving on a daily basis. You walk in and go, you know, hopefully you don't see any plants that look bad, but if you do, why <laughs> we have to fix it, you know, no, no matter it's, you know, Oh, <laughs> years and years ago, teaching some people at the place I worked that had just come on about calibrating. Like, okay, we got to calibrate our pH meter. We got to calibrate our EC meter. Like why? Well, it gets off pretty quick. <laughs> it doesn't take long to <laughs> calibrate guys. And if that's wrong, like we can chase our tail for a while. You know, <laughs> like, Hey, or even as simple as, uh, you know, having a, a couple of different temperature sensors in your rooms. Yeah. You know, you might have a hot spot that you don't know about, yep. you know, that's why you're crisping out. You're, you're drying back 10% more in that area and don't realize it. Absolutely. Oh yeah. No, I've, I've totally hung a dehu and then came in the next morning and be like, and we torched like six plants. So that's cool guys. But you know, it was like, at least that one was an obvious one. If we had like made it harder to see that we we're blown a blow dryer, at <laughs> those six plants, uh, we probably wouldn't have figured it out that quick. Cause immediately it was shocking. It was like, something must've gone horribly wrong, you know? And it, and it had, but if it wouldn't have been the person who put that DHU in the day before that walked in, I don't know <laughs> if I didn't, you know, be like, Oh shit, who knows? Well, that's, that's a stop gap that comes up frequently yeah. in, in commercial cultivation now, because it's your, your, your ground level cultivators are far too busy with all the, the challenges that come with, with this yep. industry to get in and do your maintenance these days. So you have maintenance guys, which is a wonderful mm -hmm. thing that the industry has progressed to that point that you can bring in talented individuals with yep. that specific set of experience. However, they're usually not growers. Mm -hmm. So it's something that you have to have that solid communication across the board with your team to have that, that information available all the time. Like yeah. Your, your growers need to know when a new D home went up, you know? <laughs> yep. Well, and you know, uh, I think a big thing for a lot of growers and especially their staff is trust establishing like, Hey, if something, you know, looks bad, tell me, don't, you know, don't, don't keep it a secret. Don't think anyone's going to be upset because a plant died or whatever. Like, no, it's a, we, we got to solve the problem. We need to be aware so that no one's operating on some premise that's false. I'd, I'd rather dump out 300 gallons of mixed nutrients and have you send a bad mix to a room. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Or, you know, just uh, <laughs> in my experience, when you have like too complicated of a mix, 
and you go away for the week and you come back and there's just a pile of powder <laughs> in the bottom of the res. You're like, okay, so clearly we need to simplify. Six parts is way too many for the weekend crew to mix, I guess. And it, and it sucks that that's reality sometimes, but though those, those are, that's, that's that risk analysis, I guess you're quantifying how much of a risk you want to take when you can simplify and make life easier sometimes. Joshua just posted a comment in the oh. chat. Josh, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself <laughs> to speak to it, but I'm um, speaking to the importance of calibrating the CO2 sensor too. I'll just read it here. We find so many out there off by 500 plus PPM. Yeah. Josh, you want to go ahead and speak to it? Yeah, no, I was just, it, it was a comment when he was talking about calibrating C, uh, sensors. It's that nobody ever thinks to calibrate the CO2 sensor. And we find those off so many times that, it's it's pretty crazy um, but i mean if you if you think you're feeding you know a thousand parts per million but you're actually giving toxic levels you know those plants start looking really weird nobody knows why <laughs> it's, it's so many times i've gone into facilities and like yep yep that's yep, yep. <clears throat> or the other way around you know, 800 and they're actually giving 200 and the plants are just starving yep. but, you know you can play around with that to like intentionally affect transpiration rates, right? Like you can go towards the higher or the lower ends, you know, depending on what your, your setup is for dehumidification. You know, if you don't mm -hmm. have enough, you go to the higher end to try to keep it down a little bit, vice versa. Um, if you need to get a little more transpiration going, but, uh, but you, you don't know what you're doing if your sensor is not accurate. Yeah. You're just chasing your tail, right? <laughs> exactly. You know, that's one thing I see. To... Oh, go ahead, Mikey. I was to say, unfortunately, that's usually the piece of equipment people spend the least amount of money on mm -hmm. in the grow. So it usually swings the, the quickest. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Especially like the cheapy Trollmaster ones and little wall mount. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you if you spent less than $1,000 on your CO2 sensor, expect to calibrate it weekly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, at least. And also just my favorite, I, I talked to some people a while back that, uh, you know, they had ended up buying like 15 of the Walmart hygrometers. <laughs> like just you're just confusing yourself more, man. <laughs> you're plus or minus like five percent. Uh, like throw that little white square thing away. It's amazing. yeah. The more you buy, the the less you should even trust those. And and that's you know I the mean, I, I, I this for a living. I spent five thousand dollars on a a good quality temperature humidity CO two handheld. And I mean, if you do it for a living, it's there's no point in playing around with little twenty dollar devices. Like just no, own it up, get the run with it. Yeah. And that's the pH sensor or pH meters are one of the other conversations I have with people. Sometimes they're like, I don't want to spend two to three grand on a bench top. And I'm like, I'm not saying you have to, but if you want to be real accurate, this is yeah. where we're kind of, that's kind of where we're starting the conversation and it goes up from there. And you do have to calibrate those more than your cheap one says to calibrate it. But if you want accurate results, that's the reality of what it takes. What it takes. Yeah. We got a question here in the chat from Big Cypha asking, um, can you recommend a CO2 test product for calibration purposes? Um, I'm going to actually refer to yeah. Josh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can, you can find um, gas cans out there that are, that the, the gas inside the little tank is uh, at a, at a certain specific part per million. They use Blasted. them for uh, life, the life safety test. So you see mm. like when you set up a new facility and the fire marshal comes by to do his test on your uh, CO2 life safety equipment, that's what they use. So you can, I don't, you have to look up where to pick them up, but they, they're out there. Well, there you go. Thanks, awesome. Josh. Appreciate that. I have another question. I'm sorry. I'm a passionate cannabis consumer. So Michael, I want to hear about those genetics. What's going on over there? Uh, so uh, being a larger facility, uh, a chunk of what we have to do is cater to what's hot on the market. Um, like most people in the commercial industry have to do these days. Um, we are trying to bring in more OGs, try to get some more of that gas back around. Um, like I said, uh, Ryan Genetics, uh, right now he's working with some, some King Louis and some old star killers to try to bring some of that, that old funk back into some of the newer strains, maybe slap a fresh coat of purple on one of them and get that old nose out with a little exciting color for the market. Um, across the board, like, like many people, we're running a lot of gelato-related strains right now and a lot of uh, runs, crosses, and you know your, your basic staples for the current sales market. Uh, mm -hmm. We transitioned away from uh, you know the old fashions, your, your wedding cakes and things that were previous hot industry staples to try to find something that's a little a little brighter right now just to mm -hmm. 
keep up with things as we all have to do. <laughs> have you guys uh, tried to work on bringing the flowering time down on some of those older OGs? Uh, like yeah, that? that's, that's something we're, we're trying to tune in a little bit, trying to work on uh, whether it's, you know, a, a little bit more generative as we come through, like generative a little earlier in the life phase with a little higher light intensity through the finish of the flower, but something to try to increase that maturation a little faster mm. in those try to avoid anything over nine weeks as best we can. Yeah. I mean, that's about all you can do sometimes is kind of select out of there and hope, you know, when you're doing your back crossing, some of them come in a little shorter, but I, I was just curious. That's been kind of my dream for years <laughs> to really work with some OGs and some diesels and get them down to that eight and a half, nine week range. Um, I, I haven't been able to do it yet. <laughs> my own crosses. I did some, uh, some auto diesels. That was pretty fun, but that doesn't really count. I don't think <laughs> not, not for a short flowering plan. That's different. I did a, a lot of playing around for a couple of years with a, a male of a Ken's GDP cut. And that one just, I spent too long trying to hunt the perfect pheno and never kept any of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what happens. I mean, that's uh, one sad thing about, you know, the way cannabis genetics work, you've got, you can go the traditional route with plant breeding, really, really work on some lineages or uh, man, there's a lot to be said about, you know, synthetic breeding, basically open pollination in a room for a few cycles and see what you get. It, it might be messy on the paperwork, but you can get some really cool results out of it. So yeah, it's, I guess it has a lot in common with apple breeding, <laughs> you know, but I, I always think that's fun. Pheno hunting is a blast. I uh, would love to be in a situation. I loved working at a plant breeding company. I, I bred peas, <laughs> not quite as exciting as cannabis, <laughs> but um, still exciting. You're trying to bring out the turf and those peas, man. Get exactly. <laughs> Dude, purple flowers, man. That's what we're looking for all the time. <laughs> Well, um, well so Mike, yeah, when you're, when you're, you know, shooting for these desired characteristics, like what are the considerations from a data standpoint? What is the kind of stuff that you're looking for? Um, your team is looking for on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that you're moving in the right direction. Uh, so for commercial, anything we try to run commercially, we want to look for something that's going to give us a couple of key standpoints. Uh, we want something that's going to have uh, a bright enough turp profile that it's going to hold in a jar for a while. I mean, we're all, we're all competing on shelves in the end game. So we have to have a product that after a little while is sitting on the shelf and you crack that open, you're still going to get that bright floral aroma flowing out at you. Um, and a lot of these, these wonderful strains we've been running for a long time are only good from your trapper because you got it six weeks after harvest at best. <laughs> and with the current cannabis industry, it just doesn't, doesn't work out that that's how quick that flower gets to the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, it typically takes, you know, three months is a very short period of time in the current industry for your product to hit a shelf and more likely you're looking at six months. So we need something that's going to have a bright enough turp profile and a strong enough turp profile to hold through that period of time. And then something with a, a well enough consistency in the bud structure and in our overall flavor for the smoke that the consumer is going to want to come back and grab another one. Uh, so, I mean, like I said, a lot of gelatos, <laughs> it's a wonderful base strain. It's, <laughs> it's got a, a real bright floral, fruity turp profile, a little bit of purple, frosty as hell. <laughs> I can comment to Keisha and say anything that they, that makes it to the point of going through that QA test. Um, it's probably looked pretty reasonable on the graph if they've had a, a sensor in it, you know, if they've blown it up to the point where they're trialing it, I know that's a consideration they're looking at as well. Like, is this a plant that's reasonable to grow or are we breaking our butt to, uh, <laughs> just keep it alive here. You know, there are some finicky plants that rear pheno hunting just do not work in your facility. Like they can, if you can run that whole room at that pheno, but yeah, no, fortunately having the number of flower rooms we do, we are able to monocrop most mm -hmm. of our rooms. Yeah. That's uh, awesome. However, it's still uh, it, it is the trick, like you said, of finding the, uh, the, the best strains to produce enough volume and still hit those other standpoints for you. Like it has mm. to have all the, all the ticked factors for the consumer, but it still has to produce a volume to make the corporate office happy. Uh, we, we still have to make money and keep the lights on, right? Like oh, yeah. everybody wants to go home with a little money at the end of the day. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I've grown some great, some strains that I personally love to smoke that are semi dwarfs or at least the phenos that I ran into and that don't work on a commercial basis. Why? Cause you veg them for five weeks and they still don't get very big. They're just a semi dwarf plant. They won't get big. So they're not really worth it. Um, 
However, we might be hitting a point soon where there is that, you know, heirloom market for the home grower, which is I'm, I'm excited for. I think we're going to see a lot of a lot of stuff re, resurface from there and then maybe allow some breeders to kind of push some popularity there that they can then push out into the commercial market from there. I'm seeing a lot of the guys bring in, you know, widows and trying to find the old skunks and get them mm-hmm. thrown back at the bottom end of their lines as best they can to bring that old flavor back into things, get that brightness back out. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. It's out there. And you know, I mean, some of these traits, when you start to look, I noticed uh big Saifi asked about uh good breeding info resources for a beginning breeder, uh, just classic Mendelian genetics. Just look at a book about basic plant breeding go back, uh, to Gregor Mendel. (laughs) It's pretty, pretty simple and take it from there. And then when you study it more, you'll learn about, you know, things like genetic recombination and, you know, gene linkage, things like that. Where does it actually apply to you as a breeder? It's learning about those statistics and trying to figure out, okay, can I predict based on the lineage I'm looking at, will I be able to predictably make a cross? And if I make that cross, will, um, the trait, excuse me, Try not to sneeze. <laughs> well, the uh, trade I'm looking for be one in 10, one in 20, one in 240, one in 10,000, you know, and that's where things are starting to get super exciting for cannabis, I think, is uh, we're working towards being able to search for those one in 10,000 phenos, like actually do a synthetic out to F4 and say, all right, we're doing a 10,000 seed run here. Hopefully we got one of the perfect expression that we're looking for. Um, money's making that hard for people right now, <laughs> but we're getting there. I, I think you give it another five, 10 years and, uh, there's going to be a better legal structure for breeders, especially if we get some federal legalization, better legal structure for breeders to actually, you know, create IP and protect it in a more real way right now. Like with licensing agreements, you can do a little bit, but at the end of the day, we, we need Supreme court backing to finalize those property rights. Well, and with the way that uh, the market's going for for large scale cultivation right now, where I think we're pretty quickly here in the next couple of years going to see a transition where we have our, you know, your Budweiser's of cannabis and your your micro brews of cannabis. Oh, yeah. You're going to have your your small, you know, garage style grows that are producing your your micro brew cannabis that's coming out at a boutique quality level. And then Mm -hmm. we're going to have a lot of mass scale corporate cannabis that's competing with each other for you know, the, the middle or the low end of that boutique scale. Yeah. One thing I do think that's, it's going to be interesting though, at least that I see on the genetic side is when we're talking about, you know, like, uh, breweries, for instance, a lot of those breweries, big and small, depending on, you know, if they're brewing, you know, I mean, obviously you got your, your cores, your Budweiser or whatever, that's, you know, they're brewing like just lagers and super cheap ingredients. But then you've got a lot of mid range when, you know, Sierra Nevada, dog, dogfish head, like all these nationwide Sam Adams micro brews that are, you know, not so micro anymore. Um, what we're going to see, I think in genetics is some breeders are going to lean more boutique, but at the same time, the same qualities are good for both types of producer. So like, you know, if you've got a plant that's, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It evades me right now, but there's one strain I used to grow that was just incredibly mold resistant. Well, that's good for everyone, <laughs> not just, you know, big producers, not just boutique guys. So like there's some great boutique growers I know that struggle with HVAC issues for a variety of reasons, you know, and sometimes it's not just money being able to put in. It's like, oh, the, the building you own is a hundred years old and it's got limitations. You're putting caulk in between the bricks and stuff <laughs> like you know, there was one genetic called, uh, I think it was called Slimer. We tried to give it mold, could not. The thing just would not <laughs> yeah. mold. It was, it was popular down in that Salinas Watsonville area for a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's hugely valuable. Mold resistance right now is, um, I mean, I'm sure you could echo that, Josh. I talked to a lot of people. That's one of their biggest struggles. You know, yeah. as they hit, they hit the ceiling with yields and then now they're growing mold <laughs> and it's, yeah, exactly. it's sad. <laughs> You know. And there's there's definitely breeding work to be done there. Like there was this uh, uh, Cherry West genetic that that we had back when uh, I was working down in LA that uh, would not uh, we couldn't we couldn't grow it commercially because it would it would pop 
naturally for pyrethroids because <laughs> it grew them itself naturally. You couldn't yep. give the thing tests if you tried. We'd like sprinkle spider mites on it. It wouldn't work. Um, <laughs> it, it just, you just couldn't. So there, there yep. are those traits out there. We just got to kind of combine them and select the right ones. Yep. And it, it takes space, right? Like, I mean, I, I personally or would love to get a research through, license. But, you know, typing systems like the, uh, like that Pheno specs thing, mm-hmm. uh, you line up some plants and, or there's a, what was it? I can't remember what the other one was called, but there, there's one where every single plant gets a load cell, a, mm-hmm. a, a runoff, the uh, measuring spoon tipper. It gets, you know, EC sensor, volumetric water content, temperature, blah, 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 oxygen, everything. And you can tell, you know, within a couple of weeks, things that normally you would have to wait for the yield to right. determine, you know, your, your overall, um, photosynthetic rate, you can figure that out in, you know, a week. And if you know that, you know, how fast the plant's going to grow. Um, yeah. Stuff like that. So yeah. It's out there, but it's expensive. That's, you know, mm-hmm. a, a small room setup with that system is like 250 grand or something like that. I think so. it's not cheap. No. And that's just so you can predict a crop. What happens if it's grown too slow? Do you rip it down? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. Um, yeah. One thing I think that's going to be interesting, you know, uh, Phylos, they kind of tried to start it with their cannabis genome network or map that they're doing. But, you know, just with the timing coming out of the dark ages, <laughs> we'll say, uh, you know, the, the old black market, um, it's going to take time before we can really compile all that information, you know? And I know when I talk to different breeders out there, it's like, well, where'd you get those genetics? And some of them are honest. Some of them aren't. <laughs> um, a lot of them got them from a person and they don't know where that person got them from, you know? So we're, we're dealing with, when you look at the, <laughs> the chain of uh, custody going back with seeds, it usually doesn't go like 30 years is a long time. These days, 40 years is a real long time. I don't know anyone who knows much about seed history before that, you know? So it's going to be a while till we figure this out, till they identify markers. I know there's a company here in Pullman that's been working heavily on a powdery mildew resistance gene and they've identified a few markers. That's a start. That's a huge start. Um, They probably need to get access to thousands more samples and hopefully identify those same genes in other cultivars or varieties and figure out, okay, where can we actually source some of these resistances and have, you know, source material that we like to work with, not just say this one plant that is pretty marginal on the terps, but it never molds. Like that's maybe not the best breeding stock always. Not the best marketing strategy, right? <laughs> right. And, and it's just hard. Like, um, you know, even, even with the amount of F1 hybrids out there, you know, I, there's definitely been plenty of times on a pheno hunt. We pop seeds. Hey, this one's supposed to be mold resistant. Well, I'm sure one of these phenos is, but how many test grows do we have to do? You know, how much do we have to blow up these 20 seeds and also have all these different phenos? So now we're putting most of it to oil. Like it, it gets to be an expensive process trying to identify that stuff. It's all about playing that long game. Um, Michael, I have one more question for you. And then if, if you and Seth are, are down to answer some of the live questions we came in, we'd love to hear your feedback. But, um, you know, you got into cannabis uh, as a teenager. You're, you're doing it at Vertical. We're in California. It's been a wild couple of years. 2022, 2022 has been crazy. Just like wondering what your, any, any uh, good, any advice you'd want to share with the folks out there just to kind of keep them hanging on and, and hang in there and looking forward to the future. Just keep pushing forward, man. It's, it's all we can do in this industry is just keep pushing forward. Ed. You have to weather the storm right now and trust that there's enough of us that care about the industry moving forward in a quality way with good product and appeasing the consumers as patients, because that's where it all starts is, you know, flower medicine, man, you know, trying to keep people moving forward in a healthy way. You know, even if that, even if that's mental health and you're just trying to chill out, you know, like that's still a necessity and that's a little better for your body than booze in my opinion, you know? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Yes. There's, there's enough of us pushing to, to keep this a a quality industry and to stay away from the, you know, your, your base corporate standards that a lot of the other industries have fallen victim to where it's about higher production and lower quality at all costs, you know? Yeah. I'd I'd like to echo that. You know, I do a, a fair bit of work in Canada 
And that's what we've seen up there. You know, Canada obviously has a much smaller population than like even California, but you know, they had, when it, when they, when they legalized, it was federal. So all the provinces got it. Well, green explosion, a bunch of these big commercial operations did not put out quality. They went for quantity market got flooded. And now you've got, you know, 20 to $40 million facilities that are being sold for, you know, 10% on the dollar basically because they put all this investment in, but we're not able to turn a profit as a company really in the first few years. And we're a bigger economy. (laughs) They're having a slower rollout. So like that's going to happen over and over in different States as time moves on, especially because we're probably a ways away from interstate commerce. You know, we're not going to enjoy the same luxuries that winemakers (laughs) enjoy for a while. But I think uh, as the, as the market gets educated in the U S we're seeing a turnover back more towards quality, especially, you know, um, you're always going to have your, like you said, your, your Budweiser's, your cores of the weed world, that's going to exist for sure. But I think it's also, you know, especially because there is the whole medicinal aspect to it, there is a bigger demand for quality cannabis than there is compared to say the beer market. Um, that's just kind of my opinion, I guess. Maybe there's some numbers out there that'll prove me wrong. But even when we look at, you know, uh, the Midwest, for instance, um, where I come from, people there now are way more educated than they were 15 years ago, you know, in terms of like anything about cannabis, uh, what, what are quality indicators? What are they looking for? Uh, the whole culture is changing. So I think we're, you know, like you said, to keep moving forward as long as you stay in it and you've got the right attitude. And also, you know, this business attracts entrepreneurs. If you are an entrepreneur, you know, like you got to put a lot of efforts in a certain place in order to be successful. And right now, as long as you make sure your business plan is good and your cost per pound of production is low enough that you're going to be able to survive. That's what's important. You know, just be realistic about it gone are the old days of getting super rich real quick off of cannabis. It's, it's farming at its core. Well, the the longer we have legalization, the more people we have getting a a broader experience with products. So we have people smoking, you know, what, you know, the, the turpless purple wave, right? Like stuff that has great jar appeal, but once you crack it open, there's no nose on it. It's, It's structure is not that great. You know, it's, it's there just to look good behind the glass. Yep. You know, and the, you have a lot of consumers that start with that stuff. Those are your cheap eights and cheap grams to pick up your, maybe it's a pre-ground ounce, you know, who knows mm. how you grab it first. Yep. But the longer you spend in the industry, you're hanging out with your friends, you start smoking a little better product. If you're interested in continuing using that product, you're going to start looking for better versions of it. Few people are going to mm-hmm. stick with the cheapest, worst version of what they find. And the more consumers we have gaining more experience, the more consumers we have pushing for better product. Absolutely. Michael, you just, Michael, you literally just explained my trajectory into the cannabis industry. <laughs> it's like, how did you, were you there? That's so great. <laughs> we, we all started with Mexican red hair pressed into a brick. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> you got to break up a pound of the hacksaw. Uh, You're like, is that a rock? I'm like, <laughs> I'll smoke it though. No, that's. <laughs> you guys, I'm in Texas. It's still too real for me. So come on, come on it's too soon. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Amazing. It. That is awesome advice. Um, while we have some time, let's go ahead and get yeah. to some live questions. Big sci-fi. I see you turned on your camera. That's perfect timing. You had some questions. You had a question about hypochlorous acid. Let's, let's talk about it. What's going on? Okay, I do. So I'm in the process of setting up a precision drip drain to waste. Um, I will be um, hand mixing batch tanks. And my question about hypochlorous was how long does it stay active in a solution in your batch tank? Hmm, that's a good question. I would not think a whole lot beyond 24 hours. Okay. Especially at the, you know, the kind of sol- the concentration we're putting it in, um, particularly if you have an open top reservoir, that's going to gas off a little easier. Sure. And like okay. at, at our facility, we're we're manufacturing it on site, so we don't have the the excess binders that are in a lot of your commercial purchase products. So we have typically less than twenty four hours okay. to get that run through because we're we're venting that a lot faster. 
I see. So would you recommend using that? Like for, you know, they did talk about using it for um, adding, uh, adding oxygen to your reservoir. It kind of doesn't seem like it's really worth it if it's only going to be there for, you know, 24 hours. Or would you recommend mixing a fresh batch tank every 24 hours? So in most big commercial applications, you're going to be mixing that fresh batch tank every day for that room. And that's part of where it comes in. You're mixing that hypochlorous in, and then you're doing your bulk of your feeding in the morning. So like if I go in at 7 AM, I'm going to be feeding at 10. I'm going to mix that tank up starting at 7 30. I'm going to have it fully mixed by about 8 30. Have that hypochlorous in there. That's going to kick on an hour and a half later. Most of my irrigation water is going to be in the morning for my P1, or I can do it off of that tank if I want to. And then it's not going to be as effective the rest of the day. But the point is I get that, that hypochlorous flush at least once a day. Um, if you're not going to be, you know, if in your situation that tanks, that res is going to last several days, you might not need to add it every day, <laughs> you know, yeah, add it no, that once, make sure you run it. I would not be concerned with it. Like yeah. the, the point of it is to sterilize, right? So if you've mm-hmm. got a closed top reservoir, you add it in there when you make your reservoir, then there's nothing, there's nothing alive in there, right? As long as yeah. you keep it sealed, you're, you're good. The, you know, putting it through the drip lines, if you're using a good clean salt product and not shoving a bunch of carbohydrates or sugars through drippers, like you shouldn't be anyways, then there's not really anything, you know, it, as long as it, the tank was made right. And you don't have a bunch of uh, chemicals reacting with each other. There shouldn't be anything to clog drippers with. So I, I don't think it needs to be run as a continuous feed in, in most, most batch batch tank setups. Yeah. Fantastic. That is awesome clarification. I will be using Athena pro also. Cool. And no, no extras. Perfect. Why? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Keep, well, here's the other thing. Well, I know why Josh is We asking. are a small startup and Athena is super easy. So we're, you know, we're, we're no, going to I get you. A lot of people use it. It's, it's a decent product. Yeah. I, I just, I'm just going to take, take my hat off because I have my own. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, big siphon, big thing though, make sure your res is in a dark spot. If you've got light on that and it's, it's, you're staying mixed for a few days, it'll definitely grow some algae and a few other nasties in there, especially if you have, you know, not a good seal on it. Um, and it does have its own room. So that won't perfect. be perfect. That's going to be possible. pretty good. Yeah. Especially if you can keep that temp under 70 degrees, you know, if your feed water is 60, 65 or so, you'll be golden on that. Yeah. Or just wrap it up. Yeah. 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 Just make sure it's not <laughs> yeah. getting light on it. Yeah. Cool. Follow Netafin's yeah, direction. Uh, no you, surface you water feeds. PVC in uh, underneath lights or anywhere there mm-hmm. that you can't have light. That white PVC is not. It's not opaque, um, and algae will grow inside it. Um, so if, if you do have Schedule Forty pipe already, and you don't feel like ripping it all out and uh, putting in Schedule Eighty, then uh, you can just get any color latex based paint. As long as it's latex based, you can use white even uh, and just paint that pipe. It'll block the light. Right. And I did go with schedule 80, so that is good. Sweet. Ah, oh, perfect. There you go. Thank that you guys. Why, that's why we run the hypochlorous acid daily in our drip lines is to avoid the buildup of biofilm in our white mm-hmm. PVC lines. <laughs> yep. Uh, okay. Perfect. Yep. Yep. Perfect. You got white. It's it's tough, but you know, painting that would be uh, it'd be something I'd put on the to-do list for sure. Yep, that's a great idea, Sweet. Josh. I like it. <laughs> Thank you That's much, guys. I always ag. appreciate There's your a, help. A lot of uh, a lot of farmers out there in regular ag went with the you know the cheap, not even Schedule Forty, but you know like yeah. IPS one twenty or something like that one twenty five, and you know we we'd get all kinds of calls when I worked at the uh, net. If my drippers are clogged, your guys' drippers suck, and you go out there. Yep, they they got an algae farm in their pipe. So <laughs> yeah, it's all over. Yep. Well, well and you know you, if you have any light in there, we got a hot nutrient soup out there. <laughs> light and contamination oh, yeah. are enemies. Especially if you're growing cannabis and you have kind of a higher phosphorus level, you know, those mm-hmm. algal blooms hurt in rivers and whatnot. But, you know, the higher your phosphorus load is, the faster that algae grows. Yep. Exactly. Oh, my gosh. Amazing. Big cipher. Thank you for that question. But also, we legit have three experts on today. Uh, Ryan logged in. I don't know if we can say we have four experts. I don't know. Ryan wants to see anything today, but Mandy, I know we've got some questions in our YouTube. We want to get to get those taken care of today. I'm going to throw it over to you. Oh yeah. It's been pretty hot over on YouTube. Um, so I'm going to hop into these. Dr. J303 wrote in, I don't keep mothers. So I have to veg for six weeks. How can I slow their growth to control height? Lower temps, uh, less intense lights, probably going to make them stretch, but 
if you're, he's going from seed is what I presume he's saying. If he has to do a six week veg or are you cutting off your last round before you flip them? Is that where we're at with it? Um, well, let's see if they write in with a little bit more context. Um, but we did have a couple other questions and I'll go ahead and move on to those. Um, so yeah, air expansion paragliding wrote in, hi, I'd love to talk about CO2. Uh, their first question is it beneficial to exhaust CO2 out of a room uh, during the dark side pull in flower? Um, I don't find a huge necessity to do that. I mean, if the plant's not using it and you have a sealed room, it's going to stay in there. Um, it's obviously not going to use as much CO2 at night because we don't have photosynthesis happening, but I don't really see a point in wasting it. Uh, as a greenhouse grower, I would have loved to have been able to not exhaust CO2, so I could be fairly biased in that. Yeah, if, if it gets to the extreme, you can have problems just with the, you know, when the lights first fire up, um, they, they may just keep their stomata closed entirely if that CO2 gets to toxic levels um, after they've woken up. So it, it depends, you know, if you're over 3000, sure. Yeah. Think it out. <laughs> if you're, you know, if, you, if it's getting up to, you know, 1500, 1800, don't worry about it. Just yeah. It that, and that goes back to calibrate your sensors, right, Josh? Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. You know, absolutely. You know, and, and you know, um, we are hitting a point in time where hopefully you can, uh, direct inject CO2 and not use burners. I've definitely seen my fair share of problems with burners and, uh, them going a little wild. Oh yeah. Not burning the gas, right? And exactly. Carbon yeah. monoxide and all kinds of other shit in there that causes your plants to, to go, uh, <laughs> crazy but uh yeah, yeah um, and the people you know, there <laughs> that you heard of those uh, that ag gas company they they basically do the old greenhouse trick that, that i used to do at uh, at netifin when we were building international houses it was uh you you take basically drip tape but the the heavier wall you know like they use in uh, orchards and whatnot mm -hmm. for for you know 20 year uh, drip tubing and uh, run that through the top of the canopy and then have the uh, CO2 gas uh, mm. run through those drip tubes because they, they do regulate the flow of gas just like they do the flow of water. So you get mm. pretty even distribution and it gets dumped right into the canopy um, so that it doesn't uh, it doesn't just go off into the into the exhaust. And I mean, we've even uh, we did it outside a couple of times with actually <laughs> good results. I mean, interesting. If, if you get a real still day. And you pump it out, you know, a couple times throughout the day and, and let them have just that little bit more. It, it doesn't hmm. make a difference. So that's a, it's an interesting, interesting thought to, you know, be putting CO2 out where the air exchange is happening every hour. But uh, but it, it, it does work and CO2 is cheap. So I've not? talked to uh, a few guys who have done the drip tape tr trick with mixed results. Um, however, sometimes I wonder how bad their temperature stratification is in different greenhouses, too. You know, uh, whether you, know, you have sensors. <laughs> yeah, probably. If you, if you have one in a, you know, 5,000 square foot bay, they have one temperature sensor yeah. controlling everything. It's like, come on guys. Yeah, exactly. And how, how well does that stay put? You know, if you've got 20 foot long greenhouse, they didn't know the first <laughs> thing about designing for wet walls. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I mean, you know, that's, that's what you see out there. I mean, one thing I will definitely say is, uh, the cannabis market has kind of uh, caused everyone to rethink how we go about an HVAC control in, you know, growing systems. Yeah. Well, and like you said earlier, the, uh, you know, greenhouses in the U S uh, for traditional ag, you know, up, up until, you know, very well, other than, you know, like howlings and stuff like mm -hmm. that, the, the greenhouse industry in the U S is just like you said, it's just barely good enough. Right. They just, they're just trying to keep rain off it for the most part because uh, yep. the, the climate here is so mild that we don't need high tech, good greenhouse designs, but you go, you go to other parts of the world. And I mean, the greenhouse can keep a tighter climate than we can indoors. Uh, yep. It just depends on the style, especially those semi-closed greenhouses, like the Howlings one, they, they tried to patent with Kubo or whatever, the uh, mm -hmm. optic climate or whatever it is. Um, but uh, I mean, you, you can get a better result that way because you have constantly perfectly conditioned air just mm -hmm. being blown up past the plants every second of the day. Um, so it, there's definitely uh, some new technology that cannabis is helping uh, make more widely available and widely known to the ag industry as well. 
It's pretty cool. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, before getting into cannabis, the only blackout greenhouse I'd, I had seen well outside of, you know, research at universities was, uh, moms, <laughs> uh, poinsettias actually. Oh yeah. Okay. But up here in the Northwest, they're a big one. Um, and yeah, guess yeah, what? For sure. Those people haven't switched to growing weed. <laughs> they still make a lot of right. money on poinsettias. Oh yeah. They'll make, they'll make more on that <laughs> long term than <laughs> we probably will. Yeah. yeah. Oh, is that where the real money is? Oh, wow. Well, well they, they have access to banks. The crops that do, that do far better than, yeah. than cannabis as far as, you know, profit per pound. Um, some of them, the labor gets great, like saffron or something. Mm. You can't grow it here because the labor is just too expensive. You, it all has to be harvested by hand. Um, yep. Very true. So, oh, man. Yeah. The amount of experience Stop in this room. You guys know this is amazing. I love the energy. And thank you guys for sharing all of your experience with this. We have so many topics um, going on. But, oh, my gosh. Sorry. We have a lot of questions. Um, we have a second follow-up question from Air Expansion. Um, they wanted to know, sometimes when my tanks run out, my room runs at 150 ppm for a day or two. Is this harmful to the plant? It's, you know, in my opinion, lost production time for sure. You know, any, any amount of time in flower when we're de depriving the plant of, you know, a key component when it needs it is it's lost production time. It can't build sugar, can't build structure without carbon. It's not ideal. That's for sure. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. A couple more questions over on YouTube. Diane wrote in. Um, so can you ask Seth, what kind of school or course you take uh, to learn everything that you know about crop steering? What kind of resources do you have uh, at your disposal or uh, what kind of schooling did you go to? Um, well, I have a degree in plant science and horticulture with an emphasis in urban agriculture. So that is pretty specific for high intensity urban farming. That was helpful. Before that, I worked in research for well and during for about seven years, uh, working with breeding peas, garbanzo beans, wheat, and then doing agronomy trials on field crops. So you stare at a lot of dirt and you mix fertilizer with the dirt and you plant seeds in it. And then you harvest a lot of seeds every year. <laughs> but then beyond that, you know, going into greenhouse cannabis production, well, starting in my basement, <laughs> like a lot of us do, and then moving up into commercial production when I had the opportunity and staying in that for about four years. Um, what that allowed me to do was look at a lot of what I knew about plant science and production techniques in vegetables and other high intensity crops and then start to apply those to cannabis and know what I was looking for in terms of plant morphology responses, you know, and that I feel like is what really allowed a lot of this stuff to kind of click for me. Like, Hey, here's what's going on. And then also uh, the biggest thing I, I think that helped me was working in plant research, particularly agronomy previously and being forced to, you know, I mean, the way I found out about meter group in Arroyo was years before I got into cannabis, I would install remote weather stations and wheat and barley fields using meter data loggers and transmitters and sensors. So for me, it was like, okay, we come in, if we have so much control, we can put this on a very, very, you know, rigorous system. We can run a program very easily all the way through, maybe not easily, easier said than done. But now we can look back at data from a whole run and quantify those results. We can actually pinpoint where we messed up and what we had success with. And that was something when I first came into the cannabis industry, I found, uh, at least with the people I was working with, the tendency was to be reactive because we're always stressed about that next, you know, the sale of this crop, basically. Everyone wants to fix like, oh, something's wrong. We got to fix it. We got to fix it. We got to fix it. And um, learning to step back, do good crop registration, collect as much data and look at a whole run, I think is what really uh, got me here. And then everything else kind of follows. You start noticing all kinds of small, different details. And uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. You know, you, you can have the education, but you've also got to have the experience. Again, it's, it's half science and half art. So you've got to study and you've got to apply. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, Diane also had a follow-up question. Um, can you give me more information about PGR? Um, and is it going to pass cannabis lab tests? What do you think about that? I don't know, Mikey. Do you, I don't think anyone tests for PGRs that I've really seen out there. Um, I don't. As far as where oh, yeah. California is one do of they, the most it's what do they test for specifically? Do you know? Well, like, like PACLO or something like, you know, the, oh, yeah. the ones that everybody knows about the, 
phospho load, shit like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've seen people use the chlormaquat chloride, which was a portion of what was in uh, that, that phospho load. The, that plus pack low was basically what it was. Um, but mm. there, there are some out there that the only ones that, that I, I would ever be okay with anyone using though is like like the kelp one you know just spraying kelp it's it's got natural um uh, amino acids and whatever in it that uh basically does kind of the same thing but at the, most of those pgrs are all about stopping vertical growth we have yep. we have better ways of doing that with crop steering than we do with pgr like i can get a plant exactly. to stop to stop growing vertically a lot faster with with steering than i can with a pgr so it's you know Yep. And that's, I I never personally got to use them. I I was, you know, I I didn't talk about my growing forever until I got into the, you know, commercial industry really. So I I didn't even know what what, uh, phospho load was. I I always thought it was just watered down monopotassium phosphate. So I never bought it. (laughs) Yeah. uh, yeah, So I never got to really see like what, uh, you know, how, how fast it does stop that stretch. But I, you know, I have to imagine if I can get it to slow down to, you know, less than, than an inch every couple of days, then that's, uh, that's pretty good. Yeah. And you know, when we talk about applying those, <clears throat> my big experience with PGRs has been in uh, tissue culture actually. And one thing about it, um, oh, that's different. When, well, one thing about it though, when you apply any of those to the surface of a plant, you know, especially a more mature plant infiltration of those hormones or PGRs into the plant is actually pretty slow. So like, it's like foliar applications. Can we get some things on full in a foliar application? Yes. Is it as effective as through the roots? No. And with those sprayed on PGRs, <coughs> you're affecting those surface cells, but to actually get them to penetrate and slow down stretch, like Josh said, you're going to be way more effective through crop steering and modulating what the plant's doing that way, because that is affecting that affect PGR condition. Yeah. We, we can affect those hormones, you know, <coughs> other ways without using chemicals that are actually usually more effective. Exactly. kind of the whole PGR thing. And people think it's like a magic chemical you throw on there and it's going to make everything better, but usually it turns your product dog shit anyways. So it's kind of, uh, uh yep. you don't really, you don't really want to. And if we can use steering to get the plant to do what we want <coughs> while still maintaining the best quality possible and keeping it clean and not giving anybody cancer, might as well. Right. <laughs> Exactly. And, you know, I mean, it even comes down to like, if we're trying to control powdery mildew or botrytis by some late flower spray, anytime I put any kind of spray on, especially if it's got an oil and enzyme, anything else, I might have a surfactant, um, some other sort of dispersal agent. I'm spraying quite a few things on that. I probably don't need people smoking. You no, know? Exactly. Like, no, I don't spray anything after, uh, after week three, week four ish, you know, right. just, just it, don't do it. I love the argument. What if it's peppermint oil? It's like, you want that on your weed? (laughs) It's still Christmas bud. Yeah. I'm not trying to smoke peppermint. Exactly. You guys, I'm so glad that growers out there care about this stuff these days because um, in the past it hasn't been so much. Um, so yeah, we still have some I like to smoke over. my own. You kind of have to. <laughs> I, don't I can only smoke imagine. It, so I'm not going to make anybody else do it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You have high standards for a reason. Um, yeah. So we had a couple more questions over on YouTube. Uh, Kevin wants to know what would you do differently to try to have bud sides pop in early flower? I'm on day 22. VPD is at 1.3, five to six EC, 5.8 pH light is at 60, 60%. Um, and it says 345 Watts or three, uh, sorry, 645 Watts, um, eight inches away, hard drybacks, but only one plant out of 17 are showing. Do you have any advice? Turn those lights up. Yeah, I was going to say. Turn the lights up. Get it. No, there's, there's really, the dimming thing is, is a big, I I don't, I don't know why so many people are so stuck on it. I mean, other than the fact that a lot of people took plants out of bedrooms that had 250 micromoles and a perfectly warm and moist environment, and then stick them in a flower room that's dry and hot and, you know, quadruple the light intensity, the light intensity in itself wouldn't do anything. Right. Like the, the plants turn their their chloroplasts on edge. They let the light penetrate a little deeper. You get a little more light out of it and there's no negative response. The, the, that's the short term response. The long term, you know, within the next few days, the plant starts growing smaller and fewer leaves because it doesn't need as many to provide the energy it needs for the flowers. So you actually reduce a lot of your labor. You're not going to have to pull off as many leaves. You're not going to have giant leaves shading your your buds. 
Mm-hmm. And if you leave that plant untopped, that naturally open structure of the plantlets is much light down in there as you need. We take like maybe five leaves off each plant, if that, during mm-hmm. the, uh, you know, right after stretch. And then we don't touch them again until harvest, basically. And, but if you, you know, you have these low light levels on it, you're going to have slow metabolism. You're going to have slow growth. You're going to have stretchy growth and you're not going to get a lot of bud sites because the, the plant doesn't just doesn't have the energy for it. Um, so yeah, yeah. Turn, turning the lights up would definitely, uh, would definitely help. And, you know, don't worry about it causing them to get too big because typically when, you know, if you have low light intensity, you know, starting out, say we start out two plants, same height, you put one under low light intensity, it's going to stretch up super far looking for that light. You're going to have a bunch of giant leaves that it, cause it's trying to capture as much radiation as it can. Mm-hmm. If you put, you know, the other plant under, you know, twice the light intensity, it's going to grow half as many leaves. It's going to grow more bud sites because it has the energy to even with those fewer leaves and you're not going to have as much shade going on and you're not going to have as much stretching. You'll also, you know, keep the, the top cola down because it's so it's closer to that that light intensity and you, the uh, the side branches will reach to catch up and then you wind up with that kind of menorah shape people are going for anyways with the topping but without having to touch your plants and every time you touch your plants that's another possible vector for disease and pests mm-hmm. so that you know in, in lettuce they count the touches uh, and if you go over two touches per per head of lettuce they know you don't make any money so they they want to make sure that they only touch that head of lettuce one time and it, it kind of similar in cannabis if you count your touches you're you're getting a very good analogy for what your labor bill is going to be <laughs> so if you you know that we only touch it you know once going from flower or from veg to flower we do a little little you know bottom cleanup get the little shit off the you know very bottom of the the main stalk and then don't touch them again until you know, you know, put the trellis out that first day. Don't touch them again until they've done stretch. You know, when you go in the room, just peek your head and look around, make sure everything's okay. Don't, you know, if you're going into the crop and, and reaching in and, you know, doing stuff unnecessarily, then you're just increasing your chances of bringing bugs in, basically. Um, yeah, a long, long-winded answer. I don't even remember what the original question was. But <laughs> no, that's okay. But you, you reminded me of something, Josh. Since we we're talking about the PGRs, uh, that light intensity actually is huge um, in stopping stretch. You know, if you can harden off your plants, basically take them from clone and really ramp that light up, so you're matching DLI when you go into flower. Hugely important. Um, another factor right. there: light it destroys oxygen. That's why phototropism works. So when you have your apically dominant bud that produces the most oxen out of any of those buds on the, or any of those branches on the plant, if that's light, light is blasting it. That's actually slowing down that oxen production when you're spraying to try to slow down, you know, uh, stretch, you're usually spraying a higher cytokine concentration, which is antagonistic to oxen. So you're slowing down that oxen action. So right back to that, there's no reason if you're using those sprays, there's a weakness in your system, or you might be trying to grow a freak genetic. That's not good to grow. Those do exist. Yeah, they definitely do. And you can get ones that, you know, I, we may personally love the smoke of it and it may, you know, may be really nice, but it doesn't yield shit. And it takes nine weeks to get there or 12, 12 weeks to get there. You know, just, <laughs> that's a hobby strain then. Don't grow it. For, yep. Don't grow it at a commercial facility, you know, grow it for yourself. I love, really I love like sour it. diesel, but it just doesn't have enough structure and nobody wants to buy it. It takes yeah. 10 and a half fucking weeks. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's one of those, you know, keep it for yourself. But, you know, as far as the commercial market's concerned, you know, until until people are willing to pay a little bit more for these strains that take a little longer then you know, they just don't get them. Well, and you know, one thing I've seen, guys, that I, I try to encourage people to do is a few companies up here in Washington that I know that'll do a 10 or 11 week run. They just do one or two a year, do a limited drop and uh, plan their marketing to try to help them out with that, you know, and put it back to back with one of those, you know, very few 56 days or something like that. Yeah. You yep. Know, just, you know, have fun with it. With that, so you have, you know, you have your your 10 weaker plus your, you know, exactly eight weaker and you can, you know, you average out at nine and you can still keep your total number of harvest you want. Yeah. There's, there's this whole hype world out there that, uh, I know, you know, as a cultivator, I, I never really cared about, I was never really big into the Instagram world or any of that. And I, I probably should have been and should be more, but, um, <laughs> Marketing. I'm right here with you. The only reason I got one was because Ramsey made me. <laughs> I know you're not into it. Said, I, you're gonna, if you're going to be in this industry, you kind of have to have one. Otherwise, nobody. Yep. 
know who the fuck anything is or what you're doing or <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, fine. I yeah, will say it, though, something that that we've had to do um, with the LEDs out here in the Mojave, if it's mm-hmm. uh, if, if your lights are turned down for a heat issue, because um, that's something we deal with out here in the Mojave, you yeah, might have right. to cut 10, 20 percent off your light intensity to get your heat down to a reasonable level and mm-hmm. keep your pumping out boof, you know. Yeah, uh, there's always those emergency scenarios yep. where you know you, you, an AC goes down, so you got to turn down the lights temporarily. But the the key is to make it as temporary as you can, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you if you're having that situation every single summer, then it may be time to look at your AC load and maybe add another five ton or something, you know, just to <laughs> to make up for that little difference. Even if it doesn't run for you know half the year or whatever, at least during the summer, you know that you can keep your crop consistency where it's at because eventually. You know, when there's enough of this shit out there where, you know, everybody's, you know, starting to figure out where their little hole in the market is, what genetics they sell the best, you know, where where their market is, um, you know, your consistency has to get better because people are going to go to the store and want to buy the same thing that they got last time that was really good. And if they buy the same thing and it's shit, then they're like, oh, fuck, I'm not going to use this brand anymore. They can't keep their their shit Mm -hmm. together. Um, so that, that kind of like, you know, you can go to, to Belgium and buy McDonald's and it's the same shit that, that kind of consistency is what I, I think will help a lot of people establish and maintain a brand, even without having to go into this hype, you know, let's replace our genetics every two weeks thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I think some, something to be said for dialing in a genetic really well and being able to produce that to a quality where people are like. I really like this genetic and the only person that produces it really good and consistently is this company. So that's where I buy that genetic. Mm-hmm. Um, just, just random thoughts. I need to stop talking. <laughs> oh, this is great. This is the future of cannabis. It's super yep. exciting. Oh my gosh. But you guys, uh, we just like, we blew through an entire hour and we still have questions. So we're going to have to save the rest for next time. Um, so yeah, great discussion, everyone. Oh my gosh, Josh, come back on the show. Michael, please come back. <laughs> Orion, please come back. Oh, we could take one. We could take one more. <laughs> you want Josh is on a roll. Let's go. Yeah, we do have one more. Um, so yeah, this one's about leaf temperature. So Diane wrote in, um, I, uh, how can I make my leaf temperature be lower than my room temperature by lowering uh, relative humidity? I wonder why my room temperature is 85 degrees and my leaf is 83. Is there any way so I can cool them off? It should always be lower than your air temperature, right? Like if you're, if your plant is transpiring, then it's it's letting water vapor out of that leaf, right? Which which cools it. That's that's your you know thermodynamics. It it should be happy. If you if you have a leaf that is the same or warmer than the air temperature, then that means your environment is not good. It means mm-hmm. that the stomata are very likely closed down because it's either too dry, too hot, too whatever. Um, could be a combination of your root zone plus your you know like for example when you're in the first three weeks of flower right. A lot of us do a really generative program to kind of stress the plant out a little bit and, and get it to produce a lot of bud sites. Well, during that time, if your VPD drop or goes too too far past that like 1.3, 1.4 threshold, I mean, those stomata will close on a dime and they won't, you know, the, the, the process and the hormone, the ABA hormone that causes that shutdown, it, it can be released instantaneously, but it takes like an hour or two to dissipate. So once those stomata shut down, they're shut down for a good hour at least. And you've missed out on that entire hour of growth and transpiration and nutrient movement and all that good stuff. So the, you know, trying to keep your leaf, you know, that using the leaf temperature is a good way to figure out if your plants are transpiring or not. You want to see them somewhere between, you know, two and seven degrees cooler Fahrenheit than the air temperature is. And, but again, it comes down to your sensor calibration, right? Like if you're using two different sensors to measure that, that aren't, you know, precise and, you know, for sure accurate, then you really don't know. You know, it could be that, you know, one of them is reading two degrees cooler than the actual temperature is and the other one's reading two degrees warmer. And so they look like they're the same when really they're, they're not, um, but uh yeah another long i'll let somebody else talk (laughs) the theme of this episode is calibrate your sensors everyone please (laughs) yeah absolutely well and and calibrate it (laughs) yeah well and and right there though i mean like we're just talking a leaf surface temp is really important i get that question a lot well how do i need to run my room it isn't just as simple as do you have hps or leds 
how far are the lights away? What kind of leaf surface temps are we getting? What are we getting at? You know, how high is your apical bud compared to the branches surrounding it? If that's if that thing's like two feet higher, you, you need to do something about that because we're oh, yeah, going to have some interesting issues. Getting, the bud temperatures can get really interesting too. That's that's yep. another one that would kind of you know if your if your bud temperature gets, I think it what was it above. It's like above 85, you wind up having some really interesting uh, morphology pop up. Foxtails. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that and yeah, that and just uh, some loose overall moviness. Yeah, um, but uh, but yeah, the the foxtailing is also we we found a, a lot of it just from overly je- overly vegetated bulking phases. That People too, just go a little a little too ham on it and late push. Cause, uh, <laughs> yeah, and then and then you know you switch to flush or whatever at the very end, and you see those new white hairs popping out when they shouldn't be. That's just uh, you you pushed it a little too hard. Mm-hmm. I got to say, we drop knowledge every week, but this episode was the knowledge dropper of knowledge droppers. Um, Michael, Joshua, thank you so much for joining us. You have a permanent spot uh, weekly. Feel free to join us every week. Um, I can't hop on. Yeah, no, it was wonderful having you. And then, uh, Mikey, also great to hear more about your background and what you're working with. We love seeing you on Office Hours. It was cool just to like get to know you a little bit better. So thank you so much for joining us today. Seth hand, ha- handled it. Thank you so much for holding us down like you do every week. And Mandy, thank you for co-moderating with me. We're going to wrap this up. Uh, thank you to everybody who joined us for this week's Roy Office Hours. We do this every Thursday. And the best way to get answers from the experts is to join us live. Remind, reminder, um, if you have a topic you'd like covered in a future Office Hours session, post it anytime via the Roy app. You can drop them in the chat live. Shoot us an email to support dot arroya at metergroup.com send us a dm over instagram we are also on tiktok we are everywhere so just send us a note let us know what's going on what you want to know about we record every session we'll email everybody in attendance a link to the video from today it'll also be on the arroya youtube channel like subscribe and share while you're there and if you find these conversations helpful please do spread the word thank you all so much we'll see you next week